They're talking taxes at the State House and on the campaign trail. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we talk about state issues, sometimes federal issues, and how they just might affect your life. I'm Bernie Schoenberg from the State Journal Register. There's the campaign season. We're through the primary, but believe me, the general election's on everybody's mind. And we're going to talk about some legislation and some politics with experts in the field who watch this. Bob Goff is back from uh, QuincyJournal.com. He's the editor. Bob, welcome back. Thanks, Bernie. And Andy Maloney, State House reporter for Chicago Daily Law Bulletin. How long have you been with them here? It's been a little over a year. Welcome to that, because you were here before. Right, exactly. I was here with the Sun-Times for a stint, and then I was gone, and now I'm back with the Law Bulletin. So One of the State House old guys now. So yeah, exactly. Here, here we go. Well, when I say we're talking taxes, obviously the key um, conflict in the governor's race with Pat Quinn, who took what he would, of course, call a bold step to say, I want the temporary income tax increase from 2011, personal income tax from 3% up to 5% to stay permanent, even though it was supposed to drop back to 3.75% at the beginning of 2015. Bruce Rauner says he lied to you, and the Rauner campaign, the Republican candidate for governor, is sending out a guy with a, f a fake nose called Quinocchio to say he lied to you. I'm not sure what level this campaign is on, but those things happen. Um, Who's going to win that argument, and where's the public on this? Well, I mean, I think in the beginning, a lot of people were, were pretty skeptical that the tax was ever going to roll back. So I believe this is just uh, the kind of a, well, we knew it was going to happen, and it happened. People aren't happy about it, and obviously Rauner, uh, in his uh, quest to win the governor's mansion, is going to remind people of that, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's certainly uh, picking an open wound, and I think it's certainly, it's certainly something that uh, Governor Quinn's vulnerable with. Yeah, a Paul Simon Public Policy Institute poll earlier this week, I believe, or maybe last week, uh, found that 60% of respondents were against keeping that tax hike permanent. And then, even when you told them after they responded uh, that, well, there's going to be this, you know, billions of dollars shortfall if, if the income tax increase is not extended, um, there were still only small margins of people who changed their mind even after that. So this is not uh, polling well, at least. It doesn't appear to be a popular uh, policy, and, and that sort of jives with, you know, I think what most of us uh, already imagined was the case. Right, but of course that same poll showed when asked about specific things like education and, I don't know, health care. Uh, aid to the poor as aid, well. Right. right. Yes, folks Good. were unwilling to cut all of that stuff right, as well. Right. Uh, poll respondents, yeah, are notoriously sort of, uh, you know, uh, Self-interested. Self right. Uh, you want good services, question. but you don't want to pay more money. Right. Exactly. So uh, this is the argument that Quinn is making. Now, we did see the emergence uh, just in this past week of Paul Vallis, who is um, former head of Chicago Public Schools and was a Democratic candidate for governor who lost a very narrow primary to Blagojevich back in, what was that, 2002. Uh, and he had a press conference in Chicago having knowledge of schools talked about the devastating cuts that would come to Illinois schools if the tax isn't extended and challenged Bruce Rauner campaign to say you know what they would do and I guess the Bruce Rauner folks are saying we are going to you know revamp our tax system and have a plan in the future so again uh, I guess what we're seeing is the argument that you know we were caught in a fiscal bind worse than we thought and you don't want to lose these services the cuts will be devastating again where do well, when, when you talk about restructuring taxes, that is something that resonates with people. And a lot of people, especially in downstate, feel that property taxes are unfair. And those who own the most land pay the most taxes, and they don't like it. I think they're more comfortable with use taxes, uh, sin taxes, if you will. So I think anybody, any, if they can come up with some kind of formula that alleviates that a little bit, I think that will be appealing. Um, especially when it comes to schools. When you see that most school districts are pushing about 60% of your property tax bill, I certainly think that uh, people are open to finding some other way to fund schools if they can get some sort of property tax relief. Okay, now Governor Quinn, uh, in his budget address, said, I'm going to give every homeowner $500. We're just going to send them a check, which is out of basically the income tax money. You pay your property taxes, we're not going to change the rate of your property taxes, but we'll send every homeowner 
what they don't, what he didn't also mention in that speech, but what his people, you know, did confirm, and he did like when he visited the State Journal Register editorial board, is there's a five percent credit you get on your state income tax for your property tax bill. <laughs> so if you have an average home, you know, you're going to get about a two hundred dollar break. If you have an expensive home, you know, you're actually going to lose in this process a very expensive. And if you're a renter, you're, you're not going to get that five hundred dollar sure. check. But he is saying that we are alleviating some break from property taxes. So I throw that out there. I also throw out there that um, I, I followed up. I think it might have been said elsewhere, but I did call and talk to Gov former Governor Jim Edgar this week, who tried a swap, you know, higher income taxes for schools with lower property taxes back in 97. It didn't make it through the Senate. He said Quinn is right, you know, as a former Republican governor, right to extend the tax and right to offer something for property taxes. Um, you know, does that, first of all, is that the kind of thing that will help sell this plan? And, and does, Quinn, does, does uh, Edgar give cover to any Republicans who might vote for an extension of the tax, those of whom I cannot name at this point and don't know if any will, will, will do that? Yeah, it's interesting. I think it's an example of politics making strange bed bedfellows sometimes. Uh, but it, it's it's tough to say. I, I don't anticipate that, you know, maybe just because uh, former Governor Edgar comes out and says, well, I think this is probably okay, you know, who knows if that really will affect things come November uh, when we see folks go to the polls. As far as folks in the General Assembly, as you said, Bernie, I mean, it's hard, you'd be hard pressed to go up to a lot of Republican legislators and ask them how they feel about voting to extend. Any Republican voted for the temporary tax in right. the first place, right? So, and and it, uh, Quinn might have said that no Republican has voted for any of his budgets, even though they've had compromise on some other things. But the, the parties have been pretty hard line on the fiscal stuff. Sure. Right. So we'll, we will go there. Um, one of the other kind of forming battles that, that we thought might have been over because it didn't get out of a committee once, but now uh, it, I think it was in a Senate subcommittee this week, constitutional amendment which would create what the backers of it call a fair tax, which would mean a change in the state constitution, which now calls for any income tax has to be flat. It has to be the same, and you know, that's why we have individuals are all at 5% now. If you make more money, you don't pay more in that tax, other than certain tax breaks that they can provide for, you know, poor folks, uh, but, or, or you know, the, at the lower end of the economics. This would allow something like the federal system. It would change the Constitution. Uh, Senator um, Don Harmon from uh, Oak Park and then Representative Christian Mitchell from uh, uh, Chicago uh, at a press conference and then they went to, there was a committee vote and at least the Senate subcommittee moved it forward. Uh, I believe a lot of unions want this and I believe a lot of um, kind of anti-tax groups really hate it because they say it'll, it'll take a bigger bite. Um, Harmon says it, it, you know, you'll have to make like $200,000 a year for, and if you don't, if you make less than that, this will actually be a benefit. But other people say, you know, camel's nose under the tent, once this starts, you know, middle class people uh, of all types will be uh, taxed more. Do we think that has a chance this year in the midst of everything else? Uh, it's interesting, I think. It's hard to examine it without looking at also, you know, sort of the politics of it. I mean, this hammers away at that theme that uh, you've seen uh, folks on both sides come out and, and, and try to exacerbate a little bit. The theme of inequality. Uh, the theme in, of the year. The theme of the year uh, uh, in Illinois. Um, it, it's interesting to think about in terms of if this, you know, gets on uh, a, a ballot, and there's other amendments that could be on the ballot as well. Um, trying to think about if those drive up uh, sort of the turnout, I think, for, for Democrats especially. Uh, if, if that type of proposal gets on the ballot, I, I think Madigan and, and maybe Governor Quinn are banking on some of the, the base Democrats who may not be so enthusiastic about coming to the polls during a midterm right. coming we out. We don't have the president on the ballot this right. time, which exactly. could be a big problem for Illinois Democrats exactly. because they don't have the enthusiasm of let's go vote for Barack Obama, right. one of our own. And I think Speaker Madigan and some of the other Democrats are hoping that putting something like this on the ballot will excite some of the base. You've seen there's studies out there that have shown, I mean, in, in certain scenarios during midterm, something like a 1.7 percent increase in turnout uh, when there's these types of ballot proposals. Uh, however, it, some of those may have been social issues that sometimes we think of as being more salient, mm -hmm. uh, things like marijuana or uh, same-sex marriage, abortion. Yeah, well, same-sex marriage is, I mean, George W. Bush and Karl Rove tried to put, you know, same, you know, 
should we make that legal? Some years ago, before it all, all of a sudden got popular and put it on ballots in many states to draw social conservatives out who would then vote Republican in the presidential race, which they did. Right, <laughs> right. So going back to whether it will pass the General Assembly, I mean, we, we talk about it every time something like this that's a highly polarizing issue, at least between the parties, comes up. We say Democrats have a supermajority, you know. Uh, can they kind of sort of whip everybody into line and, and get everybody to vote on it? It's uh, hard to say, uh, for lack of a better answer. Yeah. I think it's got a chance to, to pass because of the supermajority, but I think when you're talking about other issues on the ballot that draw people out, I think one of the other interesting things to look at is if term limits makes it on the ballot. That's going to draw out uh, social concern. That's going to draw out conservatives. That's not going to draw out the Democrats. Well, As, uh, maybe a little bit of everybody who doesn't like their le legislature in general, sure. even if they like their local one, which but, uh, happens a lot. And when you talk about trying to drive up turnout and, and that they're looking it's going to be a little bit down, I mean, you know, it doesn't excite the base to try to get Dick Durbin reelected, or is it just a given that he's going to roll over Oberweiss? Or is it the fact that uh, Ga Governor Quinn is not exciting the base and they're going to stay home for that reason? Uh, again, I think when you look at the dynamics of, of trying to drive turnout, uh, you would think there would be some compelling reasons to do so, but uh, maybe these other uh, you know con ballot issues, may maybe that's what's needed to gin it up a bit. Yeah. Well, it'll know. be interesting to see what you mentioned term limits, and of course Bruce Rauner is funding right. and is behind that effort and as kind of his two-pronged attack on the governorship. And there's also a fair maps amendment that we could see yeah. come out to the ballot, and, right. and you could also posit that that uh, could be conceived by cer certain folks as a sort of anti-incumbent, anti-Speaker Madigan yeah. kind Although of Although the good proposal. government groups are for that too, so right. you, get, you get an odd combination. In fact, um, let's talk about that just for a minute, fair, fair maps, because it's interesting. That would, instead of having the legislature draw new maps after every census, and the next one is after the 2020 census, there would be like this nonpartisan, and they think they have a way to get at it. And the, I saw the amendment, it's like a full page of type. It's like a 1,200 words or something. Um, and they, they try to establish this commission to, to draw a fair map. Michael Bloomberg, the, the former mayor of New York, just gave a half a million dollars to that, and he's on the liberal side of causes. Um, and then some, oh, uh, Ann and Ken Griffin from Chicago, who, billionaire couple, uh, Ann actually started Reboot Illinois, which is a, a website trying to make government better or whatever. They donated, I think, $250,000 to this effort. So it's a very odd combination of people that might get that on the ballot. Right. And I think when I saw the donation from former Mayor Bloomberg, I kind of looked and was like, well, that's it. Is that it? That's all he's putting toward this. But he does fund a lot of uh, sort of his pet causes, I think, as it's been referred to. There have been profiles of him as he's left the mayor's office in New York uh, uh, in different places. And, and this is something that he's very comfortable doing is spending money out of state. Yeah. Uh, Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, it, it's just interesting. Um, we'll see where, where that goes. I think they just might need that half million for lawyers in order to defend, yeah. because they need like about nearly 300,000 signatures once they get that uh, in. It might be challenged by various groups who think that the so-called fair map will hurt their constituencies. Uh, and, you know, it's a very tough process to justify ballot signatures that you're collecting on street corners all over Illinois because we've seen many of these things fall by the wayside in the past. And they've said they have something like 346,000 signatures so far, but they're still aiming to get 450, even close to half a million signatures just to be sure. sure. Yeah. Now, I think that that one would be found constitutional if, if it goes through. I'm not sure about the Rauner one, although I've heard people uh, on their show uh, say that he has such good lawyers, maybe they've fashioned the term limits uh, constitutional amendment by, by petition signature uh, in such a way that it can get on the ballot. It has to, you know, change the legislature func form and function. It does increase the size of the House from 118 to, I think, 123 members and lower the Senate from 59 to, 41. Is it to 41, yeah. which people who are opposed to this have already said that may, makes like massive Illinois Senate districts in Southern Illinois, particularly where there's not a, a lot of uh, uh, population. Right. I mean, I, I believe John Sullivan already has the largest district in square mileage in, in the state. So, and that would make uh, the 47th even bigger. And he's from Rushville? Rushville. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, I will just mention that, uh, and Andy talked about Democrats trying to energize people with amendments. Speaker Madigan uh, of the House, also chairman of the Democratic Party of Illinois, of course, is also pushing uh, a constitutional amendment that would fight any anything in the future that creates voter suppression, which we haven't seen in Illinois, but other states are saying you have to use ID cards to vote or 
restrict hours, uh, and Democrats have accused Republicans of trying to do this. You know, we have a Democratic legislature. It's not happening right now. But this is the kind of thing, because perhaps of the national publicity about these things, that could get Democrats out. And then Speaker Madigan on the tax question also wants to tax million, millionaires. Any, any part of your income over a million dollars a year at a 3% surcharge, uh, which only would affect like 13,000 people across the state. But again, that means a whole lot of people might vote for that as a great idea because it's not them. Right. So we'll see where it goes. Um, speaking of tax money, the other side is how to spend it. State Senator Andy Menar uh, from Bunker Hill in Macoupin County, uh, a freshman, but he was John Cullerton, President Cullerton's chief of staff, so he kind of seems to understand how these things work, has been leading an effort uh, for close to a year, I think, on trying to revamp the way schools are funded, the fu funding formula for schools, which he says is completely broken. Um, and I think that Kimberly uh, Lightford, a state, state senator, I think the way she described it at a press conference, they had to introduce the bill to say they had introduced like a, is it 400 pages? It's a big bill, it was that big. Uh, said it right now, the school funding formula in Illinois, the way they distribute the money, however much there is, to districts across the state is like having open heart surgery and using Band-Aids. <laughs> and they want to, instead of like 40% going to, through a formula based on need, they want more than 90% to go through a formula based on need. But again, they weren't saying which districts get more and which get less, but they say this is better for all. How does that sound? They haven't changed the formula since, I guess, 1997. Well, I think we need to see some details because I don't think, you know, right now I know the, the Quincy district uh, kind of gets hammered uh, in the current funding formula. So I think they would be open to any changes that would bring them uh, more money. I know because uh, in talking to them, I know the transportation issue. That's one thing where, you know, you've got a district that's got a, a, a large bus route that has to go outside uh, the uh, that has to go outside the city di the city limits and back out into the townships and when you've got a city of, of 40,000 then you've got another 10 to 15,000 people in townships and you're the only school district that's a lot of transportation that's a lot of bus time so I know that's one thing where they're looking to try to get more money also another uh, area where they feel are getting a little short changes in special education the county has some kind of conglomerate that Quincy oversees but all the other smaller districts kind of uh, work in it as well and, and they say the way they do that the funding formula doesn't work for them either so and I haven't had a chance to see the details yet and didn't get a chance to talk to the Quincy superintendent about it yet but I know that <laughs> in their opinion it can't get much worse than it currently is so I'm sure they're wanting to try something else yeah and I know that uh, Springfield schools are they're having to district 186 is cutting like five million dollars out right. of their budget this year and you know the cuts unless some patches are made are very difficult and a lot of teachers have been told you know, are, are, are worried about what, what's going to happen next year. We will see where that goes. Um, on one of those issues that might affect your life in some way, as I like to open the show, uh, the House passed a bill that would ban smoking on college and community college campuses and university campuses all over the state. Any thoughts? Is this on a fast track? Are we going to see this zoom through the Senate? This is, it's just so weird because I've been here long enough, 30 some years, remembering when they were just trying to get the Clean Indoor Air Act passed and nobody wanted the government to take their rights away to smoke at any time in any place in a closed space and things have just changed a whole lot over that time. Right, it's, it's, an, int it's an interesting issue that we've seen kind of or at least heard about um, for uh, uh, at least a couple of years uh, trying to ban smoking on college campuses. I think uh, it's interesting to see, even if it does pass, because it passed the House, it has to go through the Senate now. Um, I, I don't see uh, a lot of enormous hurdles in the Senate, but I, I think even if Governor Quinn sort of signed this into law, it would be interesting to see how it's enforced, because it leaves it up to the universities in terms of what kind of uh, enforcement mechanisms and what kind of penalties they want to put on people if they are indeed uh, caught smoking on a college campus. Yeah, but I guess, I guess the rules are, as I've read, you know, is no smoking in buildings. Uh, the only people allowed to smoke would be if you're driving in your car, not parked in your car, going across campus, and that's it. And it would not uh, restrict e-cigarettes, I guess, which don't you know, e have the secondhand smoke. E-cigarettes as well as any sort of, uh, if I understand it, uh, smoking that is being conducted as some sort of lab experiment right. on a yeah, university right. campus. <laughs> and there's so much. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right. No, I think, I, I think this is going to pass. I mean, it's, it's, it's just yet another step in you know, what we've already had. We've already had the smoking ban in place for how many years in the state of Illinois, and I think people are now starting 
starting to get used to it. I know we do have instances in Quincy where there are bars that are not enforcing it and every once in a while the health department and the city police will come in and enforce it and issue a couple of tickets just to try to remind everybody. I just think this is the next progression and, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm amazed it hasn't happened yet. It, it is just, it's a different culture. Of course, yeah. people didn't used to think you could be told to wear seat belts either. <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden, that's a, a primary offense. If they see you without one, they can stop you, which Jim Thompson said wouldn't happen back right. when he signed Absolutely. the bill. Yep. But in a, in a Springfield school gym, I was there. <laughs> just things do move on. Bob, you had, uh, before we started the show, you, you mentioned that there is something about the Illinois High School Association and Linda Chapelavia, a uh, state representative from Aurora. Aurora. Yeah, she's, uh, she wants to look into some oversight issues regarding the IHSA. Um, recently, the IHSA not only uh, had the multiplier that affected public schools, but they've also started something called the success factor that affects private schools. For example, Quincy Notre Dame has an incredibly successful girls uh, programs. Uh, they've won soccer. They won state and basketball two last year. They won uh, soccer last year. Um, they've got some girls who have as many as five state, tr state championships to their credit. Now what they want to do is call it the success factor that if you go to the state tournament and you advance and you you, you will be bumped up to class the next year. The multiplier, uh, Quincy Notre Dame only has about 400 students and they're already playing in class 3A and their girls basketball program will play in class 4A next year. And they're, gonna, they're losing quite a bit of players. So you have players who didn't really play and contribute are going to be affected by this. A lot of people don't think it's fair. And what, is, what is the new rule? What does it do to them? It, it bumps them up a class. Oh, if, if you're they, playing if in they, class if 3A, win. if you compete and go to the state tournament in class 3A, you're automatically, if you're a private school, you're bumped up to 4A the next year, uh, which that, is that, to try to get a, is that because of recruiting that they think is going on? Yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's okay. the bottom line. That's what it all boils down to. And of course, we know recruiting is rampant all over Metro East and in Chicago. And it's not only the private schools where this happens. Uh, but anyway, this is an attempt to uh, to to try to you know look uh, take a peek into the IHSA. And currently, the IHSA has exempted itself, even though they get trickle down secondhand state tax money, if you will they are immune from Open Meetings Act and they are immune from FOIA. So I think these are some of the things that people are looking at to say, let, let, what is this, this organization really quite frankly doesn't have a lot of oversight and probably could stand a little bit of and it. And so the legislation would say what, would it, would it make FOIA? I think it would open up the Just IHSA open up to, as if it were to, a governmental to, yeah, entity. To, to put them under some sort of government oversight, to put them under somebody's umbrella. Now we're real in baby step stages. We haven't even started having the hearings yet, but I think that is that, that seems to be the intent from what I've read I so far. How high school students are going to unionize if they're on the team? Oh no, that's college. <laughs> that's college. <laughs> yeah. Any any have, have you kept up with that one? Yeah. The uh, um, it it doesn't surprise me, I guess, necessarily because it seems like uh, high schools, no matter what what kind of arena you're talking about. This is something that people get very passionate about. And especially with high school sports and successful high school sports. Yeah, and, and that's interesting because I was thinking of something else popped in my mind just about what Bruce Rauner has been talking about. And one of the things he said in Champaign was, you know, Illinois, he keeps saying we have more than 7,000 units of government. It's actually just about 7,000 because it's, it's lowered in, in recent years. It's just under 6,900 some. Uh, and he thinks that's uh, something that really needs to be looked at. We need to perhaps streamline governments across the state. Well, that's been the argument with townships for years, with drainage districts, with, you know, sure. obviously some of the ones that people look at are mosquito abatement districts. But when you look at school districts, which I, th I think we still have about 800, small towns have been pushed to consolidate. Legislation has tried to make it easier to consolidate for many years, but everybody wants their football team because sure. of sports. So uh, is it realistic? Uh, is that a good campaign issue for Rauner, or do we think, to try to consolidate governments in Illinois? Well, yeah, I think you know when you look at when you look at your tax, your property tax bill, and you see where it goes to seven or eight different places. I think it would be more appealing if it was only going to four or five different places. I, I think I think that has some, I, I think that has some merit. And I think some people would be interested in that. So to the folks who are skeptical, I believe about Rauner's Republican credentials, those conservatives that maybe uh, would have been hesitant to back him. They see the Mayor Emanuel connection. They see the connection to uh, the, uh, the donations to Ed Randell in Pennsylvania. Um, the Democratic National Committee. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, an avenue to, to maybe trying to shore up those uh, votes is uh, advocating for smaller government in any form. Right. Uh, 
So that uh, could be one avenue of doing that for him. Real quickly on the IHSA issue, I think another reason that really when people around here look at it, you take a look at two C Central State 8 rivals like uh, Rochester and Sacred Heart Griffin. Mm -hmm. Sacred Heart Griffin gets affected by this. They would have to get bumped up and they would go up in class as long as they keep competing for state championships. Rochester, on the other hand, doesn't have to move up and their program has been eat just as successful. So I think a lot of people look at that and say, why Why is Sacred Heart Griffin affected and why isn't Rochester affected? Well, the coaches are father and son. I do know that, yes. And I'm sure none of them recruit. <laughs> I'm a Rochester high school uh, so I have to recuse myself from this conversation. About, and were you a football guy? I was, well, there you uh, go. before we had state championships. So. <laughs> okay, well you can revel in that which has come past. Uh, perhaps we can end on a, a perhaps interesting note, unless you were caught, there was an elevator full of people in the State House on Sunday, and it, the elevator jammed during one of the tours that Secretary of State's office provides. Uh, and it took something over a half an hour, apparently. The person in charge of the tour said that they had to call on the phone in the elevator, the elevator company, but not the fire department, but ultimately somebody pried open the door and called the fire department. And there was a special person on that elevator, Jesse Spencer, who is a actor in the series Chicago Fire. <laughs> so anyway, any thoughts about this? Th those of us who traverse those elevators from time to time? You've got to be careful. Uh, there's always a lot of people getting on those elevators, so uh, you just have to watch it. Sometimes life does imitate art. It does. <laughs> well, uh, I'm glad I wasn't on the elevator. But uh, we are just about out of time, and uh, I, would, I would mention that there was uh, a national bus that came through Springfield this week on the minimum wage, raising it to at least $10.10 a year uh, is, is what people were wanting. The head of the state AFL, AFL-CIO spoke at that event outside the state house. In Chicago, Governor Quinn and Senator Durbin spoke for that. Bruce Rauner has said different things about the minimum wage, but the latest thing is if you fix the bus business climate, I would be for increasing it, but Governor Quinn's people and videotape has shown <laughs> that Rauner was talking a different tune that it's bad to raise it for, for business. Uh, so that's another issue that we think that the legislature may well deal with this year because Speaker Mike Madigan came out just in the last week saying, well, I think people against the minimum wage are just those who have done really well in society and don't want others to do so, which is an indication, again, that mm -hmm. perhaps in this year of uh, the class warfare that we might see, we are going to see a lot of democratic moves to get people energized. With that, Bob Goff, Andy Maloney, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on Capitol View.